okay shall we yeah start now okay uh, jai bhim jai samvidhan to one and all a very warm greeting to everyone attending today's webinar thank you so much for being here please to welcome each and every one of you to a bench roaming and enlightening webinar organized by association for social and economic equality on this beautiful evening i shubhangi sunita pravesh khandare a student of rashtri sant tukaroji maharaj nagpur university nagpur will walk you through the webinar it is my pleasure to announce that today is our 81st webinar under the leadership of honorable padma shri sukadev thorat sir former chairman of ugc and icssr new delhi and president of association for social and economic equality and his energetic efforts and a willingness to do something for society i warmly welcome to you sir from last several talks thank you we are thank you sir uh, from last several talks we are inviting distinguished guest speaker expert from south indian state andhra pradesh telangana tamil nadu karnataka kerala and knowing more about the movements thought and ideologies on the behalf of association i am pleased to welcome a guest speaker the honorable dr mahitosh mandal sir head of the department of english presidency kolkata university he will enlighten us with his discourse on the topic anti caste movement in colonial bengal claims of recognition and redistribution please welcome sir i would like to welcome the honorable professor vimal thorat ma'am who always exists for the organizing the webinar before we get started i invited honorable sukdev thorat sir to let throw some lights on the purpose of this webinar okay hey, am i audible now sir very much yes. audible audible and audible visual visual visual, 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 visual <laughs> nice to see you sir uh, okay thank you very much welcome mathos mandal uh, thank you for agreeing to speak to us uh, uh, as uh, as, as subhan voice is not coming there are some network issue okay voice total voice is not coming ha ah, total sir stop hello sir professor sukhdev thorat sir your voice is not coming sir you are stop
विद्या मॅडम काही थोडस पर्यंतचा आवाज पण येत नाही का नाही ना सर ते लेफ्ट झाले आहेत जॉईन करू दे त्यांना हो जॉईन होऊ द्या मग आवाज जरी आला तरी चालतं हो हो ठीक Uh, I now invite Mr. Vinit Dupare, a student of Gokhale Institute of Economic Pune, to introduce today's guest speaker. Mr. Vinit Dupare. Thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Mahitosh Mandal. I am audible. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Dr. Mahitosh Mandal is the chair at Department of English, Presidency University, Kolkata. His research interests include caste, psychoanalysis, and Holocaust. His research paper have, pub, have been published in journals such as Lacuna, International Journal for Lacuna Psychoanalysis, CAST, a journal for social and exclusion, interdisciplinary literary study, a journal for criticism and theory. His first book, Jack's Lacan, From Clinic to Culture, was published by Orient Black Swan in 2018. Currently, his monograph on autoethnography of the ponderous, a Dalit community from West Bengal, is under the contract with Navayan, his monograph on a psychoanalytic study of a British novelist, John Fowles, is under the contract with Rutledge, and his co-edited volume on the Holocaust and popular culture in, uh, is in praise and is soon to be published by Rutledge. He has delivered about 40 invited talks con and conferences, presentations at national and international levels in 2021. He won the Navayan Dalit History Fellowship for his project on casteism in Bengal and the Global Engagement Fund of the University College London for his project on anti-casteism in higher education. A Dalit activist based in West Bengal who dream of a casteless society. Dr. Mandal is also founder and chief editor of All About Ambedkar, a journal on theory and praxis. Thank you. Uh, I will invite to uh, Dr. Uh, Mahitosh Mandal. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vinit, and uh, thank you, Shubhangi, and thank you, Professor Vita. And of course, thanks, sincere thanks to Professor Torat for inviting me to deliver today's talk. It is absolutely an honor for me to be a part of this lecture series. I have a PowerPoint presentation, so I'll be showing the slides and uh, discuss things as I go on. So without much ado, let me uh, begin uh, my presentation. Mm, yeah. Okay. So uh, very quickly, how much time do I have since like it's 611? So I continue till seven perhaps? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so I'll try to uh, be, try to maintain the time, so to say. All right. Uh, so uh, as the title uh, already announced, anti-caste movements yeah, in colonial yeah. Bengal, 
Mandal, I can listen to you, except that I am not on video. So please go ahead. Okay, thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, I will try and uh, talk about some patterns, some uh, trajectories of the anti-caste movements in colonial Bengal. Uh, and I, I emphasize that uh, that trajectory can be considered to be a trajectory from demands for recognition to demands for redistribution. I'll explain these terms uh, as I go on. So when you think about uh, colonial Bengal, it's particularly a historical period. And when you think about a historical period, we usually think about, about it from a particular perspective. And when it comes to thinking about colonial Bengal or the history of colonial Bengal, the conventional perspective is the Brahminical perspective. So if you read the history textbooks of, about Bengal, 19th century Bengal, early 20th century Bengal, you would find that there is a proliferation of references to figures like Isha Chandra Bandhupadhyay, Raja Ram Mohan Rai, Keshav Chandra Shen, uh, and many others who were inevitably Brahmins. So in a way, the history of Bengal is a Brahminical history. And in the uh, late 19th and early 20th century, these Brahmins and upper they came up with what is known as Bengal Renaissance. Many of us might know the term Bengal Renaissance that took place in the late 19th and early, uh, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, late 19th and early 20th century. And this Bengal Renaissance was particularly, in my understanding, the Renaissance of the Brahmins. So Bengal Renaissance was not a Renaissance of Bengal. It was fundamentally a Brahminical Renaissance. It was for the Brahmins, by the Brahmins, and particularly uh, of the Brahmin men. So this Renaissance, which is considered to be Bengal Renaissance, is very, very, uh, so to say, uh, you know, uh, it addressed a tiny section of population who belong to the upper caste, upper class sections in Bengali society. So if you look at uh, this Brahminical history of Bengal, you would find uh, descriptions like Bengal Renaissance, descriptions like Swadeshi movement. So from Isha Chandra Vidyashagar, Ram Mohan Rai to Netaji Shubhas Chandra Bosch and others who uh, took part in colonial Bengal in various ways, all of them inevitably came from the upper castes and most of them were Brahmins. So the official history of Bengal, which is fundamentally a nationalist history, is basically a Brahminical history. And if you think about uh, this official history, particularly Bengal Renaissance, it involved two uh, uh, kind of activities. One, it, was, it involved uh, revival, revival of Hindu scriptures, and it involved reformation of Hindu society. In both cases, reformation of Hindu society, even the idea of remarriage of widows and uh, prohibition of uh, widow burning, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, all these were confined to the reformation of upper caste Hindu society. These reformations did not involve any reformation uh, for the lower castes, for the Dalits, for the Muslims, and others. And even in the case of uh, revival of Hindu scriptures, what you find is fundamentally. Uh, an attempt to defend themselves. The caste Hindus needed to defend themselves because the British who intervened in Indian social system, they claimed that Indians were superstitious, Indians were feudal, Indians were casteists, uh, Indians were uh, misogynists, sexists, and so on and so forth. So Indians, particularly caste Hindus, they felt very much offended. It hurt, in my understanding, the male ego of the Brahmins of Bengal and for India, of India in general, but particularly for Bengal. Therefore, the Bengali Brahmins, their male ego was hard, and they needed to defend their tradition, their culture, their history, their scriptures. Therefore, they came up with rationalizing scriptures, like Swami Vivekananda, who came up with a scientific interpretation of the Vedanta. Like Isha Chandra Vidyashagur, who had to justify that widows can be remarried. Why? Because scriptures say so. So Vidyashagor, Ishyasandra Bandhubadhyay had to read the scriptures, Hindu scriptures, to justify why widows should be remarried. So every single reformation, every single rationalization, every single scientific approach to social reformation involved justification through Hindu scriptures. Even Brahma Samaj, Brahma society, even Ramakrishna Vivekananda movement, all these were an attempt to, at best, 
you know, come up with a scientific interpretation of Hindu scriptures. The point I'm trying to make is this. Fundamentally, the Bengal Renaissance was an attempt to revive Hindu scriptures, an attempt to defend Hindu upper caste Brahminical male ego. It did not concern true empowerment of women. It did not concern empowerment of the Dalits, of the minorities, including Muslims and rivals. It was fundamentally confined, in my understanding, to the Brahmin men. Even the entire notion of Strishikha or educating women, it was all about Brahmin men. Uh, you know, they got married and to claim the social status, they had to educate their wives. So it was, it was called Strishikha, education of wives. It was not uh, called women's education. Nari Shikha. It was called Sri Shikha in Bangla, which is to say wife, the wife had to be educated, not women, who are women as human beings, but women as wives had to be educated so that they could be showcased as a marker of the social status of Brahmin men. So all the reformations, all the revivals, all the self-assertions that took place in colonial Bengal, under the garb of nationalist history, nationalist politics, it was all about Brahminical male assertion. It was about, it served the interests of Brahminical men, Brahmin men and Brahminical upper caste men. Therefore, I, as a Dalit activist, as a Dalit academician, I reject this, this Brahminical historiography. I reject this nationalist historiography. I claim that this history should not be encouraged, even though the history textbooks are absolutely full of these names, Ishishandra Bandhabadhyay, Ram Mohan Rai, Vivekananda, Ram Krishna, Rabindranath Thakur, Rabindranath Tagore, uh, Raja Ram Mohan Rai, Keshav Chandra Shen, all these names, uh, you know, uh, are the names that we are acquainted with when we are children. But the names that actually matter for the Dalits are not mentioned in the history textbooks, nor in the official version of history, uh, in the official version of history of Bengal. So I claim that we need to ignore this Brahminical version of colonial Bengal, and think about an alternative version. There is another uh, existing historiography, another history about colonial Bengal, which is known as proletarian history or subaltern history. So scholars like Ronojit Guho, Gaiti Chakruti Svivak, uh, Deepesh Chakruti, and many others, they have talked about the history of the pigeons, working class of colonial Bengal. So for the proletarian history, subaltern history, even subaltern history is basically focused on class-based history, history of a working class. It does not address the question of caste. Predominantly, it is about class. So nationalist historiography is fundamentally a Brahminical historiography. And proletarian history is fundamentally a classist history. None of these history, historiographies address the question of caste. And this is where comes the Dalit historiography. Dalit history via Dalit historiography. Looking at uh, colonial Bengal from within the historiographical lens of Dalits. And this is where I claim that what Brahminical history fails to acknowledge, what proletarian history fails to acknowledge is the contribution, political intellectual contribution of the Dalits, of the repressed class population, of the untouchables, of the scheduled castes of colonial Bengal. There was a huge number of uh, uh, you know, textual political contribution uh, that took place in the 19th century and early 20th century Bengal. And this history of the anti-caste movements is a history that is glossed over, that is avoided, that is neglected, that is forgotten in the official Brahminical and proletarian history of colonial Bengal. So I claim at the very outset that this entire talk is located in that gap. It tries to address the gap created by Brahminical history of colonial Bengal and proletarian history of colonial Bengal. And in place of Brahminical history and proletarian history, I want to talk about Dalit history and address the anti-caste movements in colonial Bengal. I hope I'm clear up, up, to, up to this point. So, so the point, the question that emerges right away is how can we conceive of Dalit history of colonial Bengal? In my understanding, when you talk about Dalit history, we need to talk about the history of Dalit communities. So there were many Dalit communities in, in, in Bengal, in colonial, undivided colonial Bengal. 
Uh, as of now in Bengal, there are about 60 Dalit communities who constitute about 23% population of West Bengal. And all each of this Dalit community, each of these 60 Dalit communities has a history of its own, of their own. And that history, if we can develop and build on and write their history, that can help us understand the history of uh, Dalits in colonial Bengal. But at least, you know, there were like more than 30 uh, Dalit communities already, already recognized as scheduled caste communities around 1930s. But among the Dalit communities, among the untouchable communities, among the depressed class communities in Bengal, four Dalit communities in my understanding stand out in the colonial context. And they are Namushudra, Pundra, Rajbongshi, and Malu. So population-wise, uh, Rajbongshi, uh, Namushudra, Bagdi, and Pundra, these four uh, Dalit communities, they constitute the bulk of the Dalit population in Bengal. But in the early uh, 20, 20th century, in the, in the colonial times, the amount of intellectual and political resistance to uh, Brahminism demonstrated by the Dalit communities, these four Dalit communities stand out in uh, resisted Brahminism to the greatest extent. The Namashudra community, the Pundra community, Rajbongshi, and Malo. In this short uh, you know, talk, of course, I cannot cover all of, the, all of them and their history. I would focus mainly on the first two communities, Namashudra and Pundra. But I claim that what we, what we will find in course of our discussion about the Namashudra and the Pundra communities can also be uh, used, those findings can be used to assess the contribution of Rajbongshi and Malo. So numerically, Namashudra, Pondra, and Rajbangsha are the numerically largest communities in, in West Bengal, the Lith communities. Malo is a numerically small community. But, but Malo communities produce certain very important intellectual uh, works uh, to fight Brahminism in colonial Bengal. So let us quickly get into the discussion of the Namashudra communities. When it comes to the discussion of Namashudra communities, many of you might be acquainted with these names. At least two icons, two leaders can be talked about when you talk about Namashudra communities. One is Horichat Thakur, in my understanding, the earliest Dalit thinker of Bengal in the colonial times. Horichat Thakur, 1812 to 1878, and Guruchat Thakur, who was Horichat's son, Guruchat Thakur, uh, 1846 to 1937. And they uh, together uh, were responsible for what is known as the uh, Motua religion. So they uh, came out of the Hindu uh, sect or, or, or Hindu religion, and they tried to assert their identity uh, as, as, as Namashudras in terms of cre creating a different religious identity, somewhat, somewhat like what Baba Shaya Bambetkar uh, would eventually do, talking about conversion to Buddhism, creating, you know, uh, taking recourse to a different religion, coming out of the Hindu fold al altogether. So Horichat Thakur and Guruchat Thakur, Horichat Thakur was the founder of Motua religion, and his son, Guruchat Thakur, you know, continued the work of his father and in fact implemented the philosophy of Horichat Thakur to, to, uh, uh, to, to, to social reformation for the, for, the Dalits, for the Dalits in general and minorities as well. And uh, you know, they didn't write anything. Horichat, Horichat Thakur was, was not educated, uh, conventionally educated, so he could not write. So his words were, were uh, documented in this book called Hori Lila Brito which was published in 1916. And it was written by Tarok Chandra Shorkar, who was a poet. And uh, Guruchat Thakur also, he didn't write anything, although he, he knew how to write, but he didn't write about his uh, own uh, philosophy. So uh, Mohananda Haldar uh, wrote this book called Guru Chant Chorit, published in 1943. And Mohananda Haldar, who uh, closely associated, associated with Guruchat Thakur, Mohananda Haldar, he basically <clears throat> documented the words of a Guru Chad in this book called Guru Chad Chorit. So when you when you try to understand Namashudra uh, history, when you try to understand the history of the Motuas, these two books become almost like textbooks. For the Motuas, these two are also like scriptures for them. For the Namashudra communities, these are like scriptures. Uh, now I will talk about the contribution of Hori Chad, then, then the contribution of Guru Chad. Uh, Hori Chad Thakur is the founder, and Hori Chad Thakur, he hailed from a poor Chondal family of pigeons 
and were subjected to ostracization by the brahmins chondal why chondal because originally uh, namasutras were known as chondals and i will talk about this how the politics of changing the caste name was part of the self respect movement of the dalits i'll talk about that but for the time being chondal uh, was the name that they you know, was the name of their caste and they would be replacing the name chondal by the name namasutra eventually in course of their political resistance to brahminism so hodichath actually was born into a poor chondal family and he was you know and and chondals you know in that area uh, which is now in bangladesh they were mainly farmers peasants and hodichath himself was subjected to ostracization by the brahmins at multiple levels so like in 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 different uh, ceremonies so, social uh, uh, programs social ceremonies uh, religious ceremonies Uh, uh, the chondals were uh, treated as outcasts they were not allowed to enter uh, houses temples and so on and so forth and horichat who was certainly a very important figure even before he became this icon he, even he was subjected to ostracization by the brahmins at multiple levels but for horichat almost from his uh, you know from his teenage years was absolutely opposed to brahminism he was opposed to all forms of a hindu religious a practices and so for example uh, horichand rejected the vedas why because according to him the vedic rituals inspired caste segregation and untouchability so he he vehemently opposed the vedas if you read uh, uh, you know horilila mrito there are multiple occasions where uh, horichand is found criticizing the vedas so he rejected the vedas he rejected vaishnavism because it produced irresponsible religious beggars who engaged in unrestrained sexual activities and maintained caste hierarchy so boys the, the vaishnavas were considered to be more more liber, more li liberating uh, sect of the hindus but even with the vaishnavas uh, horichand had issues horichand thought that in the name of religion they don't do any hard work they don't do, they don't do any physical labor they go from house to house and in the name of religion they beg and that is how they run their uh, life he horichand was absolutely opposed to this he thought that one should earn oneself not beg and this boishnavs were also uh, become they become infamous for unrestrained sexual activities so among the boishnavites uh, uh, you know Uh, there would be uh, boishnavites sharing women among themselves and lot of unrestrained sexual activities could be found they were even uh, you know they were even called names because of their se unrestrained sexual behaviors uh, you know uh, uh, engaging in different kinds of sexual affairs with multiple people and so on and so forth and then caste hierarchy even within boishnavism even within the boishnavs those boishnavs who came from brahmin uh, background they became gurus vaishnav gurus but those who converted to vaishnavism but were from lower castes they were treated as lower castes even within vaishnavism so vaishnavism was not according to horichand a liberating religion because it maintained casteism it maintained immorality and it promoted religious begging which he was totally opposed to Horichand also rejected the Hindu notion of Maya and uh, the idea of Kamini Kanchon that was uh, formulated by Sri Ramakrishna. Ramakrishna said, uh, "Give up sensual desire and desire for wealth. Kamini Kanchon tak koro." That is the Bangla. So uh, Ramakrishna basically said that one has to, in order to live in the society, in the family, you can live in the family. as a family person but you have to give up sensual desire you have to give up desire for wealth and horichand found it absolutely problematic uh, he thought that sexual uh, life was important not unrestrained sexual behavior but sexual life sexual reproduction was important number 1 and number 2 wealth was important wealth was important particularly for those people coming from the lower caste lower class background for them wealth was important so it is no use saying no 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 we have to give up the desire for wealth wealth was very important and he emphasized that we must focus on economic empowerment of the dalits 
So Horizon rejected the Hindu notion of Maya and the Ramakrishna, Ramakrishnaite notion of giving up sensual desire and desire for wealth. He also partly rejected Buddhism. Why? Because according to him, Buddhists predominantly focused on ascetic life and therefore they did not tell, tell us much about how to lead family life. Family life for Horizon was important. Therefore, the term Griho Dharma, the religion of family, family religion. He was looking for a religion that would help ordinary people to live in the familial space, be religious, still uh, be uh, happy about life. So therefore, Hodichat was in a sense disillusioned with the Vedic religion, with, with the Vaishnavite religion, with the Vedantic religion of the, of the Ramakrishna order, and of the on, or, or, and even of the, of the Brahmo order. And he also was disillusioned partly with the Buddhist religion, Buddhism as it came to him at that point in 19th century. In place of these rejections, in place of these religions, Vedic, Vaishnavite, uh, Vedantic, Brahmo, Buddhist, uh, in place of these religions, Horichad wanted to promote what he called the Motua religion. And, Horicha, and, and this is also known as Motuaism. Motua religion is now known as Motuaism, uh, which is uh, like Hinduism, Buddhism, you know, uh, and Motuaism. And Motuaism, even though some Hindus claim that it is just one, one of the Hindu sects, but it is not. Motuas, particularly Motuas of today, who, whom I call Neo Motuas, they are absolutely opposed to the, uh, to the, uh, 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 to the uh, infiltration of Hindu elements within Motua religion. So Motua religion, as it was considered by Horichad, it was supposed to oppose the caste Hindu religion. And some of the features of Motua religion are like this. Horichad founded Motuaism as a religion of the here and now, and as a religion of the oppressed. As you know, Karl Marx criticized religion as the opiate of the masses. Why? Because religion asked the, asked the people, ordinary people, the masses, to concentrate on the there and then, what will happen after I die in heaven, in afterlife. So religion asked the audience, asked the masses to concentrate on the here and uh, on the there and then, and exploited them in the here and now, in the present life, in the present uh, physical reality, they were exploited. But Motuaism did not believe in a life after this life. Motuaism did not promote a life after death or heaven, etc. Motuaism promoted a life in the here and now. This is to say, how to be wealthy in this life? How to be happy in this life? And therefore, uh, Horichat focused on what is known as praxis or practical, pragmatic life, which is, uh, he used this phrase, which is very popular among the Motuas, hape kam mukhe nam. So work with hands and pray with your mouth. So when you pray with your mouth, do not forget to work with your hands. Physical labor, earning money, this must be there. He also emphasized material progress. Grihastar mul vritti orthoniti bote, banijya basote lokhi ei bani rote. Ortho ke onortho bola kato bodo bhul. He said that to say that money is useless, wealth is useless, that's the biggest mistake. It is important to have wealth and we must create a religion, we must create an ideology, we must create a philosophy that can help us and support us to earn money and be wealthy and have a, a kind of re redistribution of wealth amongst us. So he also emphasized education, he emphasized women's empowerment. And he prohibited in the late 19th century, early to, I mean mid 19th century, he prohibited polygamy. This is very important because Brahmins, Kulin Brahmins, as some of you might know of Bengal, in the, in the 19th century, many Kulin Brahmins married like, I, I remember one data where it is said that one Kulin Brahmin from Hooghly married about 250 Kulin girls. One Brahmin man married 250 Kulin uh, Brahmin girls, underage girls. And this is what uh, Horichat was totally opposed to. He, he, opposed, he was opposed to a polygamy. At the time, so I'm not developing it further. Very quickly, because of the contribution made by Horichat to the upliftment, empowerment of the Namashudras and the Dalits in general, Dilip Gayan, who is a current uh, author uh, of, among the Poundros, Dilip Gayan 
made this very important statement, which I find interesting. He said, if Ram Mohan Roy is the father of Bengal Renaissance, Horisa Thakur is the father of Mul Nibashi, Dalit, and Bahujan Renaissance. So Horisa Thakur is considered to be, uh, considered to have created, developed, launched another Renaissance in Bengal, which was not Brahminical Renaissance, but Dalit Renaissance. Let us quickly go uh, to the contribution of Guru Chand. I have a few points here I try to develop because you know, of the shortage of time very quickly. The one of the key contributions made by Guru Chad was to what, what I already said, the politics of changing the name of the caste. So Ramashudras were initially known as Chandas. In, in the 1872 census, they are uh, called Chandal. In the 1891 document, they are they are their, their caste is entered as Namashudra or Chandal. Then as Namashudra, Namashudra within bracket Chandal in 1901. And in 1911, they were called Namashudra, just Namashudra. And this is very important and in my understanding problematic as well, because somewhere the Chandals claim that they were Shudras as well, meaning that they were not outcasts, but they were part of the Varna system. They were part of the four Varna system, Chatur Varna system. They are Shudras. So they tried to say, do not treat us as untouchables. Look at the history. We have been Shudras. No more Shudras. But I find it very problematic. I'll say why. Uh, this is a tendency that you, that you find among the Pondros, among the, among the Malos, among the Rajbongshis, where, it, where these communities were trying to claim that they were Shudras. So they were talking about Shudraization, whereas Pondros, Rajbongshis, and Malos, and others, they're talking about Shudraization. So Namashudra, the name Namashudra in my understanding is problematic, but this is part of the self-respect movement. They were deeply hurt, offended, they were humiliated, dehumanized. So to, to reclaim their human personality, human dignity, they changed the name of their caste. It is kind of a defense mechanism, if you like. But the, the point is Guru Chad is that Guru Chad applied more to our philosophy, like his father, uh, Hori Chad, he talked in more theoretical terms. But Guru Chad, particularly was more uh, pragmatic. So he used the philosophy to concrete Dalit liberation. So like in 1881, he convened an educational conference of the Namashudras where 5,000 attendees joined the conference in 1881. I should also mention that in 1880, he founded the first school for the, for the Namashudras. In 1880, he founded the first school of the Namashudra. In eight, but he created the first school, but he didn't get teachers because the Brahmins refused to teach in the school, which was uh, created by, uh, by a Namashudra, a, a person, by a Chandal. So in 1881, uh, Guru Chat convened an educational conference of the Namashudras where 500 people joined. By uh, the early 20th century, Guru Chat founded, and you would be surprised to know, he founded about 1882 schools in the undivided Bengal. Ishishandra Bidyashagur, who is known as the educational reformer of colonial Bengal, he didn't create, I don't think, more than 50 schools. But Guru Chand Thakur established about 2,000 schools for the Dalits and the Bahujans. Not only that, Guru Chand Thakur started a journal called Namashudra Shurit in 1907. And he inspired three more journals to be founded. Namashudra Patrika, Namashudra Hitoishi, and Pataka. So he inspired all these intellectual activities to happen. In 1873, he called a general pigeon strike against upper caste landlords. Because the Namashudra uh, pigeons, they felt uh, discriminated by the Brahmins. So they called a strike. Perhaps one of the earliest uh, prison strikes uh, in the history of Bengal. In 1900, he inspired the Tebhaga movement for the Namashudras. In 1922 and 1933, he spoke at two prison conventions, one held in Borishal, another held in Medinipur, Midnapur. He set up the welfare Association for the Namashudras. Not only that, he met with uh, the British and, and a Scottish uh, kind of uh, uh, 
people who came to Bengal. And for example, he met with Sir Lancelot Hare, the then Lieutenant uh, of East Bengal and Assam. He uh, met with C.S. Mead and others, and he discussed the welfare projects for the, for the uh, Namashudras. So that he could procure the uh, question of reservation, reservation and representation, proportional re representation of the Namashudras, even by early 19, uh, uh, by uh, around 1906. So the idea that the, that the uh, uh, Namashudra should be empowered economically, it was already in Guru Thakur's mind. And he talked to the British uh, to procure right, you know, correct amount of representation and jobs, government jobs for the Namashudras. He fought for those rights. He fought for those rights. And you would also be uh, you know, surprised to know, some of you might already know, that Guru Chathagur was one of the major figures before, uh, before uh, Jogendranath Mondol, uh, who was another major uh, Namashudra leader. Guru Chathagur refused to take part in the non-cooperation movement that was launched by Mahatma uh, Gandhi. Guru Chathagur refused to be a part of Gandhi's anti-British nationalist movement. And when Chitranjan Das was sent by, by Gandhiji uh, to talk about uh, the participation of the Dalits in nationalist movement. Guru Chath Thakur, so Chitranjandas wrote a letter to uh, Guru Chath Thakur asking him to get the support of the Dalits in the anti-British movement. And Guru Chath Thakur wrote a long letter to Chitranjandas saying that the anti-British movement of the, of the British is not for the Dalits. Because the nationalist movement, freedom struggle, it was meant for the caste Hindus. But the real sufferers, the real victims are the Dalits, the tribals, the, Mus the Muslims of the country. And even if the British goes away from the country, their victimization will continue. So he said, first concentrate on eradicating untouchability, empowering, economically empowering the Dalits and giving dignity to the Dalits. After that, you will engage in a, a, a freedom struggle. So he refused to be a part of the national struggle, Guru Chathakur. And he said, our struggle is not their struggle, and their struggle is not our struggle. He, he made it very clear. So what he actually did, instead of confining Motua religion to the Namashudras, uh, Guru Chath Thakur was in favor of opening up uh, Motua religion for all the Bohujan population. And here is a quotation, I don't know whether you can see it, here is a quotation from the text of Sri Guru Chath Thakur, where he said that Namo Shudra Kule Janma Hoye Che Amar, Tobu Boli Ami Nahi Namtar, Dolito Pirito Jara Dukhe Kate Kal, Shushne Shushne Bole Jato Jal Chal, Shikha Hara Dikha Hara Ghare Nahi Dhan, Ehi Shabhe Jani Ami, and before that, he said that Namashudra Teli Mali Ar Kumbhokar Kapali Mahishudas Chamar Kamar Podashe Tati Ashe Ashe Malakar Kotoi Musulman Thik Nahitar Namashudra Teli Mali Kumbhokar Kapali Mahishudas Chamar Kamar Pod Tati Malakar Muslims. All, they, all of them, according to Guru Chad are part of the Namashudra religion, are part of the Motua religion. So, so Guru Chad Thakur was particularly interested in opening up Motua religion as a Bohujan religion, as the religion for all the Dalits and not just one Dalit community, and also a religion for the Muslims. Very interesting proposal, I should say. And then, uh, let me very quickly uh, get into this discussion of the Pondros. So I have already discussed uh, the, the Namashudras, uh, two Namashudra icons. Let me quickly talk about the pond rose in, in like uh, five, five to seven minutes for us. Uh, so when you talk about pond row community, apart from Namashudra community, you have the pond rose who, according, according to me, uh, produced a lot of intellectual works and also contributed to the political trajectory of the Dalit movement in the, in, the, uh, 20, uh, in the early 20th century. And I, I should also mention that I am from the pond row community. Uh, 
and i am particularly interested in the history of the of the pondros for that matter and uh, there are many people who contributed to the dalit movement of the pondros in colonial bengal but uh, three of them uh, in my understanding are very important there are many but i don't have time to talk about all of them rai charan shardar 1876 to 1942 he is considered to be the father of pondro uh, movement uh, he was the president of many pondro organizations in the early 20th century rajendranath sarkar Uh, who so uh, rai son shardar was basically from the south 24 four porganas district uh, rajendra sarkar was from khulna which is now in bangladesh and mohanrath karan was from midnapur so pondros were scattered across the undivided bengal south 24 porganas calcutta uh, midnapur khulna jasor and many other places so this, the, these are the three major uh, the pondro icons from colonial bengal and they contributed uh, you know immensely to the trajectory of the pondro movement in particular and dalit movement in general in colonial times uh, uh, so that's what i have said the vibrant political intellectual life of the pondros in colonial bengal the pondros came up with at least eight magazines that i have discovered so far bratto kshatriya bandhav pratigda to pondro kshatriya samachar satyajug dipti sangho and pondro kshatriya So look at the dates from 1910 1918 1920 1924 1927 uh, 1935 1938 so around that early 20th century pondros were absolutely intellectually vibrant and they produced so much work including autobiographies poetry political pamphlets and so on and so forth so many works that those works have now been published uh, under eight volumes of what is known as pondro monisha and i have you know for your convenience i have given a photograph of the second volume of pondro monisha so it is published by pondro mohasangho so pondros now associate themselves with uh, with buddhism very much so the organization that has published these eight volumes is known as pondro mohasangho mohasangho named after the buddhist sangh and uh, so eight volumes of works produced in the in colonial times by the pondros and the third point that i need to mention is that pondro movements were heterogeneous shekhar uh, bandobadhyay who is considered to be the name when it comes to the discourse of caste question in bengal shekhar bandobadhyay has very conveniently tried to homogenize has very conveniently tried to homogen homogenize the dalit uh, movements in colonial bengal i absolutely don't agree with him he has also tried to say that uh, you know dalits in colonial bengal were subdued by brahminical imagination i also do not agree with him i think dalits developed an independent political intellectual tradition and that tradition was also heterogeneous it was not homo homogeneous there were conflicts within the dalit communities they debated they fought for particular rights they were engaged in certain discussions amongst themselves so intra community debates happened inter community de debates happened among the dalits so we need to talk about we need to recognize an independent heterogeneous political intellectual tradition of the dalits from within colonial bengal that can be a task of dalit historiography to begin with now this is a book that was written by mohandra nath karan uh, it should be mn karan mohandra nath karan sorry it not mk it's mn karan and i should mention this is the first english book written by a dalit in colonial bengal perhaps in the history in the history of, of colonial uh, history of bengal the first english text written by a dalit is a history and ethnology of the cultivating poles it was written by mohandra nath karan who is undoubtedly considered to be the greatest historian among the dalits in bengal manav karan produced many books all of those are are, are history uh, uh, historically sound and historically researched works and in this text a historian why did mohandra nath karan write an english text because he wanted to make certain claims to the british he wanted this book to be read by the british therefore he wrote, wrote it in english but there are problems with the text i will i will mention those problems very quickly so this book was or the entire project launched by mohanrath karan and rajendranath sarkar uh, i should i should i should just go to the previous slide just for just to make a reference that raicharan sardar and mohanrath karan these two two figures on on both sides of the slide they fought for they wanted to they claim that we are pondros we are not pods we are pondros 
we are kshatriyas we should revive our kshatriyahood and so on and so forth but the person in the middle rajendranath sarkar he was opposed to kshatriyaization he said it is of no use we are treated as untouchables now we are maltreated we are ostracized we must try to gain as much opportunity from the government as possible so rajendranath sarkar was ready to be categorized as a scheduled caste as a dalit but rajendranath sarkar and mohanrath karan they did not want to be categorized as depressed class or as scheduled caste because they said if we are categorized as depressed class and scheduled caste then we then our dignity will be also uh, kind of reduced in order to assert our dignity we must assert ourselves as kshatriyas and not as scheduled castes so there is a conflict between rajendranath sarkar and rajendranath sarkar or mohanrath karan and rajendranath sarkar rajendranath sarkar fought it single handedly and fought for the rights of the dalits so to say so uh, as you can see in the second point of the slide podh to bhatta kshatriya to pandra kshatriya podh in in bengali it's a slang and and these people who are now known as pandras they were uh, called podhs as, as in, in a derogatory man manner therefore they wanted to replace the name pod with the name bhatta kshatriya so the pandras claimed that we have been kshatriyas but we were uh, we were degraded because brahmins didn't like us eventually therefore we became bhatta kshatriyas but we are actually kshatriyas we are not to be considered untouchables this is the claim made by raicharan shardar mohanrath karan and others and they eventually uh, uh, wanted the name pandu kshatriya for themselves but the british government didn't allow that they said it would be confusing to call your self kshatriya so the in the document in the official documents they are now known as pandru they are known as pandru so from podh to pandru is the is the trajectory of the pandru movement like from chandal to namoshudra in the case of the namoshudras or from koch to rajbongshi in the case of rajbongshis or from malo to malashutriya in the case of the malo community and many others point i'm trying to make is this that in this text mohanrath karan vehemently argues that we pundros had a glorious past that we are descendants of king pundro king pundro who was the step brother of sri krishna who was also known as pundori kaksho so pundro pundro pundori kaksho that we come from a kshatriyo a past kshatriyo ancestry claims in this book that pundros are not podh or untouchables or bhatto or mlechos we are not untouchables we are kshatriyas we are part of the we have been part of the varna system now we are maltreated as untouchables but look at history we are not untouchables what a defense mechanism okay I, i i think it's a misplaced kind of a uh, mechanism defense mechanism it's not the right way to annihilate caste it is what is known as sanskritization to some extent they wanted to say we are part of the varna system we must not be condemned as untouchables in this text mohanrath karan also says pundros must not be looked down upon as chasha chasha is the derogatory term for a farmer in bangla or mixed caste so he said pundros must not be called untouchables nor chasha nor mlecho nor pot and he comes up with an explanation that porashuram and brahmins uh, degraded the the pundros from the kshatriya status therefore they have they have become pots now untouchables now and the only way to fight this uh, misrecognition or this humiliation according to mohanrath karan and uh, rai charan shodran adas the only way to fight this discrimination this humiliation is to reclaim kshatriyahood is to reclaim the identity of being part of the varna system this is what mohanrath karan argued rajendranath sarkar was opposed to this idea rajendranath sarkar he hailed from a poor pandru family of farmers and was subjected to caste discrimination in temple school college and court house he in fact wrote the second autobiography of the pandrus the first one was written by rai charan shardar second one it is known as jibon katha and jibon katha i have the book here in front of me it's jibon katha and uh, jibon katha was written uh, by uh, by uh, rajendranath sarkar jibon katha literally translates to the story of my life the the history of my life if you like 
And there, and this is the person, as you can see, uh, uh, I have already put him there. And, uh, and this is the book. This is the, this is the book, Jibon Kotha by, by uh, Arajanwar Sharkar. And here he is perhaps the most assertive uh, Pondro, uh, uh, you know, activist, if you like, from colonial Bengal. And he, and there is a reason to it because he suffered a lot of discrimination firsthand. First of all, he was born into a poor Pondro family in Khulna in Bangladesh, which is now in Bangladesh. He was, he was a son of a farmer. And then he when you know he was repeatedly whenever he would go to the temples you know during durga festival uh, durga puja festival you know uh, at one point uh, he was driven away from the festival from the uh, temple and the temple was washed with cow urine to purify and he experienced it firsthand in the school he was looked down upon by his upper caste brahmin teachers because he was uh, he was a son of a farmer and and in the college the principal discriminated against him in Kolkata. And when he became a lawyer in the courthouse, the, gl the glass that he used to drink water from was not tasked by the Brahmin lawyers. So he experienced untouchability firsthand. And therefore, for him, it was not a question of whether Pondros had been Shotyos in the past. It was a question of how to recover from the damage done to us. And therefore, he dismissed Kshatriyaization as misleading and the glorious past as of no use to the Dalit victims suffering in the present. It's, it's no use whether we had been Kshatriyas in the past. We are suffering. Now we are being treated as untouchables. So we have to fight back from our positions of victimhood. Therefore, he is vehemently supported the inclusion of the Pondros in the list of scheduled castes prepared by the government, British government in the 1930s. So from 1933 to 1935, there were huge debates among the Pondros. And the Pondros debated particularly one section of the Pondros represented by Rajendranath Sharka, uh, sorry, uh, re represented by Mohanranath Karan and Rai Charan Shardar. They said Pondros must not be considered as scheduled castes. They must not be considered as Dalits, uh, Dalits or depressed class. They have been Kshatriyas. They should not go for a reservation. Rajendranath Sarkar, on the other hand, said, we must go for reservation because we are so much economically, socially, culturally backward. We have been damaged so much in history that we must, if we want to compete with the Brahmins, we must take recourse to reservation. So Rajendranath Sarkar, whatever, uh, you know, where Pondros have as of today, it is because of figure like Rajendranath Sarkar. He was vehemently opposed to all other Pondro thinkers. And he said, doesn't matter whether we had been Kshatriyas, we are now untouchables and we must, uh, you know, assert our rights. We must reclaim our human personality. We must go for redistribution of wealth, which is offered by the uh, British, British government, which was offering reservation, etc., etc., at that point in time, 1930s. So, to conclude, I would very quickly conclude, uh, give me just five minutes. Uh, a lot of things could be discussed, but this is the crux of my, dis uh, crux of my talk today. So I'll take a, a five minutes to discuss this, this particular position. I could have discussed, apart from Pondros and, and Navashudras, I could have discussed Rajbongshis, I could have discussed Malo community in particular, and many other communities, but of course I don't have time. But I claim that if you look at the trajectory of the movement of the Pondros and the and the Ramashudras, you will find there is a pattern. What is the pattern? In my understanding, the anti caste movements in colonial Bengal underwent four stages. There were four stages to this movement. Stage one is what I call dehumanization, which included experience of discrimination in the hands of the Brahmins. So be it a chondal, be it a pod, be it a coach, be it a malo, be it a jhalo, whichever be the community. Every community experienced that they were being dehumanized. They were being humiliated, ostracized. And it is the intervention of the British that opened up a possibility because you know, British, when uh, they colonized India, they did not look at the Indians as Brahmins and Kshatriyas and Boishas and Shudras and outcasts. They looked at the Indians as natives, quote unquote natives. All Indians were natives for them. Therefore, the British, as Karl Marx rightly said, 
in the in the opt quoted essay the british rule in india and marx said that the intervention of british in indian history will bring about change from feudalism to modernity because british will, will expose the feudal casteist uh, mindset of the indians and will help the indians overcome feudalism and embrace modernism because the british opened up ideologically and also economically certain resources for even for the for the dalits and for the lower class and lower caste people these dalits did not accept dehumanization anymore so yes they experienced dehumanization stage one is experience of dehumanization stage two is demand for recognition that yeah you are treating us as non human as almost less than animals but look we are kshatriyas we have a so the demand of recognition but i call this demand misplaced reclamation of human dignity through kshatriyaization and borno identification it's misplaced reclamation of human dignity why because the question is not to reclaim my kshatriyahood they were dehumanized the simple and plain claim would have been to say look we are also human beings but they ended up claiming look we are kshatriyas we are shudras this is problematic in my understanding reclamation of human personality as baba saheb ambedkar says this is it's the reclamation of looking at the human being as a human being not as a kshatriya or a vaishya for the for the dalits to be more precise but they thought that in order to be accepted in hindu society they had to claim that they were kshatriyas but this is a misplaced reclamation of human dignity stage 2 demand of recognition involving misplaced reclamation number 3 stage 3 stage 3 involved what i call demand for a redistribution as you find in rajendranath sarkar as you find in guruchat thakur they were people who were for a redistribution of wealth they said it doesn't matter whether you have a glorious past what matters is that we are suffering from what nancy fraser would have called mal distributive injustice so the term reclamation recognition and redistribution are taken from nancy fraser the american theorist and for nancy fraser social injustice is of two kinds one is misrecognition and the other is mal distribution misrecognition is that kind of social injustice which involves when a human being is not recognized as a human being and that is the source of what is known as human rights movement human rights is about recognition of human beings as human beings and there is mal distribution as social injustice which involves the fact that some people are have nots and some people are haves that wealth is not equally distributed across people wealth is mal distributed so in the third stage of the anti caste movement in colonial bengal there were demands you know i i should say from early 20th century onwards there were there were demands for redistribution of wealth and this demand could be fulfilled through the reservation policies the representation policies which were uh, advanced by the british and the stage three therefore could be called demand for redistribution and stage four which happened just before uh, india was uh, uh, liberated from the british regime 1940s onwards with the advent of baba saheb ambedkar at the national scene and his uh, and his him being invited by uh, jogendranath mondol who was uh, another major namoshudra leader in the bengal province the bengalis gradually the bengali dalits gradually got influenced by ambedkarite ideas and eventually in the post colonial times also by ambedkarite buddhist ideas so for in the stage 4 it was no more a demand for reclaiming their kshatriyahood it was a demand for what baba saheb ambedkar has rightly called annihilation of caste so in the in the among the dalits of 1940s of bengal and the dalits in the post colonial bengal and dalits of today no dalit in uh, today's context be it from the pondro community be it from the navashudra community be it from the malo community no dalit asks for being recognized as a kshatriya their ideology has changed and everybody is now against caste and you will find lots of ambedkar missions ambedkarite organizations buddhist organizations in bengal scores of them here and there in bengal now who are totally 
uh, opposed to the question of caste system in its entirety, which could not be accomplished in stage two, where Dalits in late 19th century, they were ready to embrace Borno system, embrace caste system, if they could be accommodated in that system. But in stage four, the Dalits were opposed to the caste system in its entirety. In my understanding, demand for recognition in stage two could not annihilate caste. It was one second reproduction of Brahminism. But in stage four, it was a total destruction of Brahminism. Therefore, let me conclude with this couple of lines that if you look at the history of anti caste movements in colonial Bengal, you would find it, it, that it underwent certain uh, trajectory. And the trajectory is from dehumanization to recognition to redistribution to annihilation of caste. And I claim, even though I haven't discussed all the Dalit communities, this pattern can be found uh, recurring in other Dalit communities as well, with a few exceptions here and there. This is the main underlying pattern. And this underlying pattern can help us to build the Dalit historiography of Bengal. I, I hope I made sense. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you so much, sir, for the outstanding presentation. You have given the information about the history of colonial Bengal in a very simple way and elaborate the gist from the Brahminical history to Dalit uh, community history and the stages of anti-caste movement in uh, colonial Bengal. Thank you so much, sir. Now, uh, may I request uh, Professor Vimal Thoratra for sharing her insightful words with us. Dr. Mahitosh, you can withdraw your slides. Yeah, please. Okay. Yeah, can I? He's make called some... Dr. Subdev Thorat, sir. Yeah. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, we are one and the same. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> She's right. Okay. Uh, uh, she is sitting behind me. You can see possibly no. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah. I think. Uh, <laughs> yes, um, I'm here. Yeah, Mandal, I'm here, uh, we are really. Thankful to you for such yes, a spirited, very, spirited, very spirited uh, uh, lecture, presentation, presentation and lecture by you. Uh, and you have taken uh, so much of uh, uh, pain and effort uh, to note down and prepare the slides and PowerPoint presentation. Uh, I remember I had read your issue, uh, your article uh, to publish in, I think, Journal Cast, isn't it? Yeah. But I was not aware about you at all, to be very frank. And then I asked Vinod Mishra that, can you locate and discover that gentleman who has written that paper? I would like to him to speak on the uh, the Dalit movement or anti-caste movement in the colonial mm -hmm. big wall. And uh, I'm so happy that you have really brought out the uh, aspect of that very, very clearly. Uh, the four-way classification of that moment uh, is very, very important that the conflict between within the Dalit community that some are claiming Kshatriya hood and by becoming Kshatriya then asking for uh, uh, rights, um, uh, on, par, on par with Kshatriya, but what happened, in any case, they are below Brahmin then. But the other point of view was very, very important. Uh, that is Sarkar, I think, uh, Rajun the Sarkar, that, who argued that, no, it's a question of really building the humanity. It's a question of having an equal right. And I think that that view ultimately prevailed. And therefore, they, they began to uh, recognize their disabilities, recognize as a scheduled caste included in the list of scheduled caste for reservation. Uh, but also in the fourth stage, as you have very rightly pointed out, that uh, reservation is an opportunity to give them the fair share. But ultimately, it is the caste system which needs to be annihilated. And therefore, uh, at the end, they came with that solution that the caste need to be annihilated and we need to be considered as a normal human being with an equal right. Uh, I don't want to summarize because there will be several questions. I just want to say that if I look at these uh, four people and, and three of them, uh, uh, Sardar 1876 to 1982, am I correct? 
so he uh, in fact uh, sardar lived during the ambedkar moment very much 1876 to 1982 is that the period for sardar that's how i have taken from your no uh, uh, right sardar is 1876 to 1942 yeah that is right yeah 42. so still he is uh, yeah, yeah. during the ambedkar moment then you have sarkar 1903 to 1979 am i correct for the period yeah and then you have Karan, 1886 to 1928. 1928, isn't it? Yeah. So particularly the Sarkar and uh, Sarkar remain uh, throughout there during the Ambedkar moment. Similarly, Sardar also remain. And I think uh, uh, they they certainly watch the Ambedkar moment and uh, Sarkar obviously then agree. Uh, was in favor of including the scheduled caste in that list and getting the reservation, which ultimately he got. Uh, but Dr. Ambedkar Association was very uh, close uh, uh, with Jogendranath Mandal. Uh, that was during 40s. But at that time, these gentlemen were also there. Sardar was there, Sarkar was there. Uh, and we do not see any connection between them and uh, Dr. Ambedkar, but we do see a connection between Jogendranath Mandal uh, and Dr. Ambedkar, and as you know, uh, Jogindranath Mandal invited Dr. Ambedkar to contest for uh, the uh, Constitutional Assembly seat because he did not, he was not sure whether he will get elected from Bombay. And for eventually, Jogindranath Mandal helped him, and he was elected on the Constitutional Assembly from the Bengal. Bengal presidency. Yeah. And also the Scheduled Caste Federation, uh, which a political party which was set up by Dr. Ambedkar, it was also, it has also the Bengal chapter, Bengal uh, Shadul Caste uh, Federation. And I think Jogindranath Mandal was the president of that. So I think even the political party of the Shadul Caste, uh, the Shadul Caste Federation of Ambedkar was in Bengal. And I think Ambedkar contested, Dr. Ambedkar contested for the Constitutional Assembly seat on, on the platform of Shadul Caste Federation. Yeah, from Bengal, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and later on, uh, I think Jogindranath Mandal was... Um, uh, was the president. Eventually, Jogindranath Mantar, I think, developed differences with Ambedkar later on, on the issue of Muslim and on the issue of separate electorate, because Dr. Ambedkar then sort of asked for the alternative for the separate electorate in the qualified joint electorate, because he thought that uh, separate electorate won't get. So Jogindranath Mandal developed differences with Dr. Ambedkar on a couple of issues. Uh, uh, so I think uh, if, uh, uh, if you could just uh, spend five to ten minutes uh, before we take a general question to um, talk about uh, this period, the, the Jogindranath Mandal, Ambedkar Sharul Caste Federation. And uh, I don't see any connection between these two gentlemen when they were around, uh, Sarkar and Sardar, uh, with Dr. Ambedkar's movement. After that, I think if you speak about five minutes, seven minutes on that, then we will go for a question answer. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Professor, for, for, for this very absolutely relevant question. <clears throat> so, as far as uh, uh, Raicharan uh, Shardar is concerned, uh, I don't, uh, I didn't come across many uh, references in the Pondro history about uh, Raicharan Shardar being uh, Raicharan Shardar talking about Ambedkarite movement or Ambedkar for that matter. But certainly, Rajendranath Sharkar, <clears throat> who has written in detail uh, about, uh, about Jogendranath Mondol as well. So Rajendranath Sharkar was from uh, uh, Khulna, and Jogendranath Mondol was from Borishal, both of which are in Bangladesh now. So Rajendranath Sharkar was a member of the, I mean, not a member, I think, yeah, I think he was a member, uh, but definitely a supporter of the uh, uh, Indian National Congress. So. Uh, Rajendranath Sharkar supported Indian National Congress. Even he uh, participated in his college life in the non-cooperation movement of uh, M.K. Gandhi. Even though when he participated and he said that he was uh, he he was on the streets, uh, you know, for uh, Mr. Gandhi, the principal of Rajendranath Sharkar's college was not much happy because he said, "You are a pondro, 
and you are participating in the congress movement and you know that's nothing for us so he basically looked down upon him as as a dalit dalit's contribution is nothing to congress so rangan sakra felt very unhappy about it and he uh, stopped associating with congress and later on jogannath mondol approached rajendranath sarkar to uh, to uh, expand the shidul kashmir federation and to contribute to the movement that jogannath mondol was already a part of but for some reason rajendranath sarkar even though he was humiliated by the congress party and he writes about it in the in the book jivan katha he he says that you know i am loyal to congress okay even after he was humiliated so that episode is 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 all is mentioned in in this book itself that i i was referring yeah. to in jivan katha his autobiography he says that jogannath approached jogannath mondol approached me and i think jogannath mondol was then in pakistan he, he was the first law minister of pakistan jogannath mondol and then uh, because he thought as you rightly pointed out uh, he he thought that muslims if we could uh, you know jogannath mondol at one point said that uh, it is like he was opposed to partition like bengal partition in particular jogannath mondol was opposed to partition why because he said partition is being basically devised by the upper caste hindus and if the partition takes place the dalits will be uh, will be oppressed by the brahmins in west bengal and by the muslims in bangladesh in in east pakistan so he he was opposed to partition and he thought that uh, you know be befriending muslims or alliance with muslims would be more productive for the dalits than an alliance with the with the caste hindus and therefore uh, he wanted uh, rajendranath sarkar to because rajendranath sarkar was a major figure in khulna uh, region of of, of the of, in that time and he actually wanted rajendranath sarkar to be a part an active part because he was then in pakistan and he was he couldn't be uh, you know uh, uh, active here all the time in the in the bengal region even in the in the context of west bengal he thought that shedul caste federation could be developed further but rajendranath sarkar for his quote and quote loyalty to congress he uh, in a in a very unfortunate uh, uh, way i should say rejected jogannath and as as you definitely know the, there is the recent book by doi doi payan shen called the decline of caste question in bengal uh, it, it is a it is a book on jogannath mondol jogannath mondol and the decline of caste question in bengal and there doi payan shen has uh, at one point correctly argued that because jogannath mondol did not get any support from other dalits from around his his native place and after he left because as you know jogannath mondol resigned from the uh, you know cabinet in pakistan because yeah. he he found that uh, muslims were fundamentally you know muslim bureaucrats and muslim in general they were uh, they were oppressing the dalits as well so they, he his entire vision of an alliance between muslim and the dalits somehow came came to an end and by the time he returned resigned and returned to uh, 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 this part of the country he uh, he was not accepted he was a political outcast by the time so there was communist communists were coming up congress was still there and the scheduled caste federation and scheduled caste party couldn't really make a mark here and i think precisely because of these dalits like rajendranath sarkar and others who did not support him as baba saheb ambedkar at one point said that you know he has been most uh, uh, you know uh, disappointed by people of his community i mean by the dalits have trusted him all the most in a way and i yeah. think it was the same with jogendranath mondol because he unfortunately did not get any strong support from those dalits who actually mattered who was actually yeah, i understand i understand but i think uh, jogendranath mondol was a very kind hearted and very sacrificing man that he surrendered his seat to dr ambedkar yeah. constitutional assembly and it is because of him dr ambedkar could go to the constitutional assembly and become the minister yeah and became the minister became the chairman of the drafting committee yeah. i think yeah, absolutely uh, absolutely uh, i will uh, uh, just make two point and then we switch over the questionnaires i think if you can help us to find out uh, i have a feeling the son of jogindra mandal has written uh, three four volume biography of his father uh, so if you can connect me to him i we would like him to speak on jogindranath mandal and dr ambedkar at some stage professor uh, thorat i i think he has passed away oh, oh. yeah 
recently this year perhaps yeah, yeah are there some surviving son and uh, uh, yeah i will have to check on that you check up okay sorry sorry the second thing i will mention and stop that is i think your lecture was very important because the shifting the shift from chandala to namshudra uh, was a very significant shift because the untouchable were uh, originally called chandala now there is a whole lot of literature now that uh, uh, especially Jog, uh, vivekanand cha has published a book on origin of untouchability and he brought out a book chandala that how chandalas were converted eventually into uh, untouchables now this book came in 2018 you can see chandala here yeah 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 and uh, uh, the uh, Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar also eventually in his book, Who Were Untouchable, uh, accepted that Chandala's, the origin of untouchable is in Chandala. And uh, Chandala, but the Chandala's, this word prominently found in West Bengal. Uh, it is also used in our area. I think uh, Maharashtian Mandari Jethe Basleli Hai Tumala Maita Silki Kadi Kadi Apan Bhaya Manta Chandala, Shivi Munun Vaparta Chandala. But that was a caste name. That was a caste name of untouchable. The his historical root we must know. So uh, I think the uh, the Chandala uh, were the original untouchables, uh, which were later on converted into untouchables. That has been agreed by Vivekananda Jha and other, but also by Baba Sahib Ambedkar. Thank you very much. Vidya, please go ahead with the answer question. Thank you so much, sir. Okay. A question from Thangraj, sir. Uh, kindly elaborate the fight against uh, upper caste landlords in 1873. And again, uh, one question we have heard a uh, Tebaga movement by CPIM, but you brought Tebaga movement in 1900. Kindly elaborate. <clears throat> good questions, I should say. Very good questions. First one is uh, about the 1873 <coughs> pigeon strike. In my understanding, that was. The, 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 in both these cases, both these questions pertain to Guru Chat Thakur, okay? And Guru Chat Thakur, as I said, was more uh, politically active than his father. His father was more into, uh, and of course, he was uh, uh, politically active. But uh, Guru Chat Thakur was the founder of Motua religion. And the ideas were basically implemented, as I said, in the socio-political context by his son, Guru Chat Thakur. And Guru Chat Thakur, in both these instances, 1873, and strike, it was important because uh, Guru Chat Thakur realized that unlike what the Marxist historians think, uh, Guru Chat Thakur realized that the bulk of the pigeons, they belong to the Dalit communities, untouchable communities. So you cannot talk about classless society without first creating casteless society. Guru Chat Thakur was very sharp in that understanding. So he said, that the exploitation of the <clears throat> pigeons in the 1870s in the you know East Bengal region, the exploitation was happening not only because they were lower class people, uh, wow. pigeons, poor people, but exploitation was also happening because they were un wow. most of them were untouchables, most of them were chondals. So he said that our fight is not only against the landlords but also against, particularly against the Brahmin landlords. Yes, so 1873 peasant strike therefore is important because it was an anti brahminical strike. It was not just an anti landlord strike. That's how it becomes very important. Second movement, Tevhaga movement, you are absolutely right, the Tevhaga movement as we know is basically the 1946-1947 movement which was spearheaded by the uh, Communist Party. But what we, what we do not know that the entire concept of Tebhaga in the context of Bengal was particularly, uh, you know, uh, started by Guru Chathakur. In 1910, around that time, 1910, 1915, 1922, during this period, Guru Chathakur was the first person to actually come up with the concept of, you know, uh, a second, uh, third of the share of the crop. So like uh, two-third of the share of the crop. Tevaga basically means that, that the farmer will get two-third of the crop share. And this concept was actually 
uh, initiated by Guru Chath Thakur. If you look at the Tevada movement history, nobody mentions Guru Chath Thakur. As I said, the history is either uh, written from a Marxist perspective or from a nationalist perspective, not from a anti-caste perspective. So I think we need to rethink the Tevaga movement and the history of the Tevaga movement because the, like 1873 Pijan, you are absolutely right, 1873 Pijan movement, 1910 Tevaga movement. Think about the lines of the movement. It is basically all these are Pijan movements. Pijan movements lost by anti-caste leaders. That is the difference. Not by, not by a communist leader, but anti-caste leader. And I think these are uh, glossed over. These are not mentioned in the history textbooks or official histories of Bengal. So that would be my quick response. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, next question from Dr. Sujay Kanti Ghoshal. I uh, respect it, sir. It was really a nice presentation. I have queries. First is due to division of Bengal, there have any effect on, on Dalit movement, especially the uh, Motua movement of Namashudra. And uh, sec uh, second is, uh, what's your comment about Thakur Panchanam uh, movement? Once again, two very important questions I could not cover because of the paucity of time. Absolutely right. And uh, uh, Professor Thurat sir also had asked me to talk a bit about Namashudra movement particularly. So uh, Professor Thurat sir also knows that uh, due, due, to, due to partition or just before uh, the Bangladesh Liberation War, the Congress was in power, as you know, in the National Congress was in power. They were the ruling party in Bengal. And uh, the Communist Party promised that if the Namashutras came to Bengal, they will be given a place to live in the, live in the country, live in India. So the, many of the Namashutras, because of uh, persecution, persecutions in, in uh, East Pakistan, uh, you know, uh, Islamic persecution in East Pakistan, Muslim uh, uh, persecution is in, in East Pakistan, they, they uh, escaped. East Pakistan or Bangladesh and came to Bengal. Because as, as Jogandranath Mondal rightly was apprehensive about, Jogandranath Mondal feared that if the partition takes place in East Pakistan, Muslims will be a majority and Dalits will be tortured. Because Dalits are not just Hindu, they are the lowest of the low. And if they come to Bengal, West Bengal, they will suffer because West Bengal would be dominated by the Brahmins. If you, you know, I'm sure many of you have come to West Bengal, you would know that the cream, uh, creamy layer, quote unquote, the main place of Bengal, let's say Kolkata. You come to Kolkata, you make a survey, you come to the heart of the city, you won't find any, any major Dalit population. Most of the people living in Kolkata, occupying Kolkata, so to say, are Brahmins. So many of them migrated from uh, East Pakistan, much before, even in the early 20th century, they, they migrated to Kolkata. So this migration, it happened, Namashutra migration happened in the 1970s in particular, but before that as well. And they came to uh, uh, Bengal, they were sent to Dondokaranno, and then they were brought to the Morijhapi Island in Bengal, and they voted the Communist Party to power. And the Communist Party came to power, and after the Communist Party, CPIM came to power, they uh, Ask the uh, Dalits, the, the Namashudras living in Morichapi Island, to leave the island. And just for an information, personal information, I was born and brought up in the Shundarbuns, and I lived just near the Morichapi Island. So, so my uh, grandparents and my uh, uncles, they had seen what happened in Morichapi Island. Even the CPIM uh, these days, they say that Morichapi massacre did not happen. It's a lie. Because those people who are near the Shundarman Islands, like us, we know that this actually happened, that hundreds of dead bodies, police were sent to shoot the Namashudra refugees in the uh, Morichapi Island. And their dead bodies floated on the river uh, uh, near the Shundarbuns. So due to partition, I would say, the major suffering happened to the Namashudra uh, population. That is why Namashudra uh, population, Namashudra community is the most politically uh, active because they have undergone the worst amount of victimization. The more uh, you are victimized, the more be you become politically, uh, uh, so to say, sensitive, active, and so on and so forth. The bulk of the political movement in the, in the context of Bengal was launched by the Namashudras. Uh, that is the reason. 
The second question is about Ponchanun Borma. Very good question. I didn't have time to talk about Ponchanun Borma. Ponchanun Borma, in my understanding, was a major figure. He was a Rajbongshi leader, as some of you might know. And he, but the, the point about his, him was that he was one second uh, for Kshatriya. So he said that we are not coach, we are not tribal people, we are not uh, outcasts, untouchables, we are Kshatriyas. So he promoted the term Raj Bangshi. Raj Bangshi has the word Raj in it. Raj Bangshi literally means the descendants of kings, Kshatriyas. So even for Ponchanun Borma, he was all for Kshatriyaization. And Raj Bangshis, even though they are categorized as scheduled castes, most of the Raj Bangshis think that they are, they, are, they are much above all the scheduled castes in Bengal. So they have a social status, etc., etc. They think they are superior to all other scheduled castes in Bengal. Some of them, I'm not saying all of them, but some of them. And Ponchanan Bhuma particularly was not in favor of being recognized as a, as a, as a Dalit, Dalit person, as a, as, a, as, a, as a Dalit political leader as well. But I should say that Ponchanan Bhuma made a huge contribution to the Rajbangshi community. Rajbangshi community is very advanced today, economically, socially, educationally. Why? Because Ponchanan Bhuma single-handedly led uh, the entire community. There is, a, there is now a university uh, in his name in West Bengal. Kujbihar Ponchanan Borma University. Uh, uh, and of course, this is a political game uh, played uh, by the governments of, 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 of today. But the point remains that Ponchanan Borma, even he created uh, separate banks for the Rajbangshis. They called it uh, the uh, Rajbangshi Kshatriya Bank. So he wanted to economically empower the, uh, the Rajbangshi community. So the, my answer would be very briefly, uh, Ponchanan Borma was a major Rajbangshi leader but once again, he fell in the trap of what I said, misplaced, misplaced reclamation of Kshatriyahood. He could just have said that, you know, we are, we are human beings, we are, we are, we are not to be uh, uh, oppressed or maltreated. But he said that, he thought that by claiming Kshatriyahood, he could, they could claim their dignity. But I think, but I think this is the part of history. At that point in history, that is how uh, the Dalits felt they could resist. History has changed. At that point in time, they didn't come across Ambedkarite ideas, ideas of Perrier or Fule. Today, we are very much conscious so that history, the political trajectory, political attitude has changed. But that is my brief comment on Bonsanon Borma. He had, had been a major uh, uh, Rajbongshi leader in colonial times. Thank you for the question. Vidya? Yes, sir. So, there, are, uh, there are several questions you can read out. So, Harichan's motto. Yeah. Priyanka Das. So, sir, I think uh, comments from Priyanka Das, a uh, truly research and much needed historiography uh, of Bengal. Thank you, Mahitosh, for uh, deconstructing the hallowed Brahminical history of the land. It was a brilliant talk, as always. Thank you, thank, you, thank you, Priyanka. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, again, question from Thangraj, sir. What happened to uh, Harichandas uh, Matuism religion? Very good question. Actually, I presented a paper in a, in a, uh, in a, a university in the UK recently where I talked about neo motuaism So I mentioned... Uh, I don't have the book here. It is in the table. I mentioned two books. One was uh, uh, Hori, Hori Lilamrito, another was Guru Chachori. There is a recent book which has tried to take out the gist of the ideas of Hori Chathakur and Guru Chathakur and reassert Motuaism as an anti brahminical anti-caste, and more significantly, anti-Hindu religion. Motuas of today, they are very much strong. And all the political parties, including BJP and TMC, Trinamool Congress, Bharatiya Janata Party, the major uh, two political parties in Bengal as of now, they are trying to appease the Motuas to get their votes. Because Motuas are very strong. I mean, they are a large population in Bengal. And Motua votes matter today. 
but motuas is now the motua intellectuals now are very very conscious like i will give you the names all of you might know like monoranjan bapari monohar mauli bishwash kollani thakur charal all the names that are nationally known as the major dalit intellectuals from bengal they are from namoshudra motua community and motuas are particularly interested at this point in time because in the 19th century the ideas of guruchat thakur and horichat thakur even though those are radical ideas those were kind of uh, brahminized to some extent if you read the books of hori lila mrita and guruchor chachor it would find that there are brahminical elements there are attempts to call guruchat an avatar an attempt to call horichat an avatar avatar a hindu avatar and so on and so forth hindu incarnation of a, of a hindu god there are attempts like this in these books the motua movement now is very much i should say following the trajectory that i mentioned is very much uh, conscious of its politics and and doesn't at all uh, give uh, any kind of uh, consent to brahminization so an absolute anti brahminical anti caste approach is found in the contemporary motua movement and there are some absolutely brilliant motua intellectuals today who are very much ambedkarite very very much ambedkarite and also buddhist so they are trying to strike a, a a balance between buddhism and also to to find out connection between motuaism and buddhism as well so i i should say as i said it is the ambedkarite the impact of ambedkarite ideas on the dalits in general in bengal that has created this change in the stature of the motuas in contemporary bengal yeah um is thorat here uh, mandal moitosh yeah. uh, i sort of uh, forgot to mention that <clears throat> you you refer to three uh, uh histories yeah. one is of course the brahmanical history brahmanical interpretation second is the subaltern which focus on peasant and class Uh, brahmanical history fo focus basically on defending brahmanism and then you give us an idea a detail idea about uh, the dalit discourse but by while mentioning uh, the brahmanical history you brought out a very important point uh, which dr ambedkar also refer in an elation of caste that that the raja ramon rai and others of that time uh, the renaissance that we talk about uh, he said that this was a reform of a brahmin family <laughs> that, the, that the british uh, uh, brought uh, wanted to have a law against sati childhood and uh, widowhood <laughs> in the in the beginning the brahmin opposed but later on they realized that this will this will be difficult therefore they uh, studied the shastras as you have rightly pointed out and brought the justification from shastra that hindu shastra doesn't favor sati hindu shastra doesn't favor widowhood this one okay. shastra doesn't favor childhood all that but they ultimately they accepted maushik maushila uh, child marriage ultimately they accepted the uh, the british uh, legislation but the point that i want to ask you if you have any comment to make is that during the same period 1772 75 the british had passed the first east india company enacted the first anglo indian act 1972 very famous and that the major provision of that act was that all law the east india company will run the society as per the hindu law for hindus and quran for muslim and in hindu law uh, they mention that the hindu uh, law will be as per the hindu inheritance and other but also by the caste now the this this uh, raja roman rai and others who talk about the renaissance they didn't oppose they support in fact they i i am i i am i am told and i read that they say that okay you can have a legislation to ban sati child child marriage and the widowhood but don't do anything about the caste caste system is a brahmanical social organization everything economic social and other thing should be as per the caste so they supported caste and they that is why they got pressure on the british as a matter of fact what do you think of this retrograde role of this uh, renaissance leaders 
Yeah, that's a very good question. And I should thank you, Professor Thorat, for, for making this point because I was not uh, uh, conscious of this particular act. So I will read more about it. I think it's a very important point. The alliance between the British and the Brahmins that is brought, brought about here with, the, with reference to the question of caste. <clears throat> but uh, so I don't know much about this because I, I just got to know about it uh, from you right, right now. But I would like to make a couple of points. One is about the glorification of Radha, Mohan, Radha Ram Mohan Rai that happens. And as you rightly mentioned, even, even a few days back, you know, I think a couple of months back, there was the birthday of Radha Ramon Rai. And everybody in Bengal, in, in the big places in Bengal, like a big academic uh, places, everybody was celebrating the great contribution of Radha Ramon Rai to, to, to Bengali society. But as you rightly mentioned, Radha Ramon Rai was not initially uh, ready to accept the law against Shati, even though he is considered to be the founder father of Bengal Renaissance and somebody who promoted the anti, uh, you know, anti burning of the Sati law. The point is, I'm trying to make is that how Raja Ramon Rai changed his image in the, among the Bengali Vodruloks eventually. And he is now read as the person who actually is considered to be responsible for the prevention of burning of the sati. I think the uh, our study of this particular act, Anglo India Act, as you said, 1872. Is it, is it 1872 or 1772? 1772 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, by 17, East India Company. I can read out in four lines, but I don't have in front of me now. Okay, so I will read it. I will read definitely. I'll look it up and read because I think it could be really important for my research. They say, I mean, their position was that okay, go ahead with these three act, but don't touch caste system. Yeah. You retain the caste system, and that is how the caste caste word came in that in, in that law. And from 1972 to till I think 1856 or, or so, we were governed by the British ah. government as per the caste rule. Okay, I'll, I'll read it up. Thank you. Thank you for this point. Thank you so much. In, I fact, mean, yeah. in fact, I must say that in, you must read this, that in the Bengal court, uh -huh. when, this, when this act was passed 1772 and the judges were the British, and when the decision was that the Hindu cases will be dealt as per the Hindu Shastra and the Muslim cases will be dealt as per the Quran, and the British judges do, did not know the Sanskrit or the Persian, so they appointed one Brahmin and one Maulavi to help them <laughs> to take the decision. And I gave you one case that when there was a case of slavery, uh, that was one, one slave woman had a son from the master and he died. And she claimed that the, her son should get a property. So she went to the court and uh, the British did not know. So they asked the Brahmin, what is the position about slavery? You know what the Brahmin uh, attached to the court said? He just said two lines that as per the Manusuti, there are 17 slaves. So Hinduism accepts slavery and the judges should take the decision as per uh, their My goodness. So you can see the in practice, you can see how the caste system was implemented by the Britishers. Mm -hmm. At that time, Brahmin did not oppose. In fact, they wanted the caste system to continue. And just a quick point, that's a good point, because otherwise Dalits in Bengal in particular, they have always considered the British to be to have brought benefits to them. Yeah, yeah they, they indeed they brought. They I'm indeed they about, did. I'm talking of Brahmin, but they, yeah. they gradually open it up. They brought individual right. rights, freedom, equality, but the high caste did not allow them. So they acted very cautiously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. True, true, true. Yeah. Yeah. I, I tell you one again one story because the participant will know that by 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 1855 the Britishers opened the education for all. Till 1855, from 1972, there was no education for native people. But in 1855, they opened up education for everybody, including including untouchable. Now, since it was open, a boy from Maha, uh, uh, Dharwad, Karnataka, sought an admission in the school, but he was refused the admission by the high caste school manager. 
So the boy wrote a letter to the governor of the Bombay presidency that I am a scheduled caste. I am willing to pay the fee. This is the public school. I must be given admission. You know what Britisher took? The Britisher took a decision that, that it, yes, he has individual right to have an access to education. But by admitting him in the school, if the school will be closed down, then in that case, he should not be given uh, admission. And you know what they say? They say that let us see what Bengalis have done. And when they, when they discover in Bengal, also there was no provision. Bengal has left, left the decision to admit untouchable or not to the municipality, local oh government. God. Let us take you or not. Now, obviously, the local municipality will not give them. So this is the adjustment that British had to do. I mean, they had to open up the education, but under the pressure of uh, pressure of the high caste, uh, the the they they did not give very openly the admission to the untouchable. In fact, then what they find out, they go for alternative. They open up a separate school for scheduled caste, and they gave an additional grant to the Christian missionary school and asked them to admit the scheduled caste oh. because the public school supported by the government, the high caste would not allow. So. So in 1972 and 1986, you can see that high caste has been continuously opposing the equal right to the scheduled caste. And same thing happened in West Bengal also. The Brahmo Samaj, I think the Brahmo Samaj was set up in West Bengal to oppose what was coming from the British. They think that there is a threat to Hinduism. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Kalad, Thank sir. you. Okay. Uh, now, question from Dr. Trilok Hazare, sir. A very nice presentation. Uh, which group I B more closer to Ambedkarites? Uh, what is percentage of SC in education, politics, and economical situation and present status? <clears throat> oh, I mean, which group will be? <clears throat> Dr. Trilok Hazare, sir, please elaborate. Trilok Hazare, sir, can you hear me? Yeah, so which group is closer to Ambedkar rights? Yeah. And what uh, is the percentage of SC in education uh, politics? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes. Which, which, which group is more closer to Ambedkar rights? Yeah, you have explained four groups. That is the Namo Shudra, uh, Pondri, Raj Bakshi, and Maluz. So which group are more closer? Are everybody else closer? And what is the percentage of schedule caste in present status? Economy I, would, education. Yeah. I would say uh, Namoshudros and uh, Pondros, because Pondros, even though they have a huge population, they are absolutely underrepresented. They are the most vulnerable, uh, one of the most vulnerable Dalit communities in Bengal. Because uh, Pondro is probably the fourth highest, Pondros have the fourth highest population in Bengal as of now. What, but is the first the, and, what is the first and second and third? Uh, I think first is Rajbongshi, then Namoshudro, uh -huh. then Bagdi, then Pondro. Bagdi is another uh, another uh, Dalit community, but I couldn't really find uh, any major intellectual contribution from among the Bagdis. Uh, but uh, the, the thing is that Namoshudros are most politically sensitive, politically, uh, shall I say, active population. And if you ask me to give me one name, I should would say Namoshudra. Namoshudra is the most, uh, uh, they, are, they are closest to the Ambedkar ideology. Pondros are also close to, close to Ambedkar ideology. Problem with the Pondros is that, uh, I, I would say it's like two to three percent of the Pondros are politically, uh, not even two, I think I would say one percent of the Pondros uh, are uh, politically sensitive, Ambedkarite and so on. 99% Pondros are, uh, they live below the poverty line. They live in the districts of South 24 Parganas, near the Shundarwan Islands, uh, in these areas mostly. And these are the most under, uh, most underdeveloped uh, places. In fact, I would tell you that the island where I was born in, uh, electricity went there in 2018. In my village, electricity went there in 2018. Just uh, know, uh, three, four years back, electricity was there. So I was born and brought up in a, in a uh, mud house with thatch roof. There was no uh, paka houses nearby. There was no paka roads nearby. And there were no hospitals, etc. 
where I was born and brought up. I was there till my school days. So uh, I, I'm just one example, but there are many uh, pondros now. But and you would also find that uh, you know I only talked about uh, Dalit men who act, uh, participated in uh, uh, anti caste movement. There is no major representation from among Dalit women from none of the communities. But there are Dalit women from Namashudra communities who are very political, very much politically active. So I would say Namashudras are the most politically advanced and Ambedkarite among all the groups in uh, Bengal as of now. And next would be Pondros. Rasbongshis, they try to distance themselves from the caste question. Even though they are included as serial caste, even though they are probably the topmost, the highest population, etc. But they try to avoid the caste question, not get into the anti-caste politics. Namashudras talk about, uh, Namashudras absolutely into it. And uh, Pondros are next. So as of now in Bengal, and Malos as well, some of the Malos. That's why I mentioned Malo. Uh, so Namashudros, Pondros, and Malos, they are the Ambedkarite uh, and anti caste uh, activists as of now. Uh, mostly from these groups, you would find people find talking about Ambedkar, anti caste uh, uh, politics, and so on and so forth. And but the, guys, if you look at the uh, if you look at the education sector, uh, you know. All the vice chancellors, as of now in Bengal, uh, since the independence, all the vice chancellors have been, in my understanding, Brahmins or upper castes. You won't find a single. Uh, there are there are, there is a uh, there is a dearth of Dalit professors in institutions. In most cases, reservation is not implemented. Uh, you know, after two three years, seats are be reserved. Upen Bishash was a Namashudra minister. He wrote at one point that he could not uh, really uh, uh, work as an anti caste activist when he was made a minister because he would have to work under the leadership of the Brahmin chief ministers. So I would say overall, there is a very under representation. If you look at the industry, Tollywood, Tollywood industries, film industry in Bengal, all the Tollywood heroes are Brahmins, all of them. I mean, and all the uh, actresses, all the stars are Brahmins. Inevitable. There's no Dalit presence in the industry at all. Okay. So there is an absolute underrepresentation, and still Bengalis claim that Bengal is a ca castless land. In the Nondigram violence, eight, I mean, 10 Dalits were killed. In Morijabi massacre, hundreds of Dalits were killed. Uh, Chuni Kotal was forced to commit suicide in 1990s uh, because a Brahmin professor, uh, you know, discriminated against her because she was, she was from a criminal tribe. Atrocities against Dalit students, Dalit professors, Dalits in different public sectors are happening every day. But still Bengalis think that Bengal is a cast castless land. Jyoti Boshu, the CPIM, the chief minister of uh, Communist Party, uh, when Mondal Commission agitations were, Boshu said in Bengal, there is only PC, proletariat class. There is no BC, backward caste. So I think that that was the climax of how communist regime threw the caste question under carpet. But what people do not know, and even when Kanchayalaya came to Bengal at one point in 2018, he said that in Bengal, caste is like a cancer without diagnosis. In Bengal, Caste is like a cancer without diagnosis. Caste is there, but people haven't been able to diagnose. But the reality is that the upper caste, the Brahmins have neglected the caste question. And there are vernacular literatures and people from among the Dalit communities who have diagnosed the caste question, but it's just that they do not have enough political resources, economic resources to you know, launch, let's say, a political party, to, let's say, uh, successfully continue the works of Kashiram or there is BSP in, in Bengal, but very, very minor presence. Bojan Samajbadi party is there, but very, very minor presence. My point is that there are scores of Ambedkar missions, social organizations uh, named after Baba Shab Ambedkar, named after uh, Gautam Buddha, uh, named after uh, Bohujan uh, population, the Bohujan political party. But these are more like social organizations cultural organizations, but not active political organizations. That is why you don't have political presence and assertion that much happening at the state level. It happens here and there in this district and that district, but not in the urban space as such. 
Therefore, caste question is very much there. Caste anti-caste assertion is very much there, but just that it is confined to vernacular literature. That is why I also wrote that article that Professor Thorat sir was referring to, because I thought it was important to bring out the truth about what the Dalits in Bengal are actually doing. They are actually engaged in anti-caste discourse, but they are writing in vernacular, and that is why people don't know about them. And the historians, they do not talk about, even when uh, Gaiti Chakuti Srivak talks about archive, that the subaltern cannot be found in the archive. When Srivak talks about the tribe, tribals, Adibashis, she talks about tribals as represented by a Brahmin author, Mohasheta Devi. So, Gaiti Chakuti Srivak's way to talk about tribals and caste subalterns is through the eye of a Brahmin author. Mohashita Devi. She that just does not talk about the writings of tribals and scheduled castes themselves. Dalits and Adivashis in Bengal, they have written a lot of works in, ba in Bangla. But nobody, no official elite historian talks about this archive of the Dalits and the Adivashis. Ruf Kumar Borman, a major Dalit historian, he teaches in Jadupi University. He wrote a very interesting work. This is called, Yes, the Scheduled Castes Can Write. Yes, the scheduled castes can write, which was the response to Spivak's essay, can the subaltern speak? Okay, so I'm saying it is happening in, in Bengal, it is there, but somehow it is not coming to the national level and somehow they are still underrepresented, so much so that everywhere there are Brahmins and Brahmins think that there is no caste atrocity in Bengal. That's the paradox of the caste problem in Bengal, I should say. Uh, how much is the percentage of Telugu caste? How much is the percentage? 23% of West Bengal's population, I think as of 2011 census, 23% of uh, West Bengal's population is scheduled caste, and they, they amount to around uh, 2.5 crores of total uh, population. The total population of uh, scheduled caste, I think as of 2011 uh, in Bengal, I think it's 2.5 crores. Uh, can you focus uh, some idea about the how many schools are college institutes? Uh, under the scheduled caste peoples in present status? I mean, dedicated to uh, the scheduled castes. In, in, in your uh, one slide, you have mentioned that there are 2,000 schools open in yeah, 19. Yeah, yeah. But what is the present status? Is there any colleges? Is there any institute, medical institute, engineering institute? There are schools like that? Good question. Uh, recently, uh, because, uh, because of the intervention of the BJP in West Bengal politics, uh, caste politics is re-emerging as it were. And in Bengal, uh, for example, recently a university has been created, which is called uh, Horichad Guruchad University. Named after, and, named and after Horichad Thakur and Guruchad yeah. Thakur. Recently, a university called Ponchanon, Kuchbihar Ponchanon Borma University has been founded, mm -hmm. uh, named after Ponchanon Borma, the leader. So what I'm, and there are funds being provided to Namashudros, uh, to different Dalit communities as of now. So I would say there is an attempt to create these, uh, uh, you know, universities and colleges, not colleges as such, but universities in the name of the Dalit leaders. But this is a recent phenomenon. Communist Party never did this. Now BJP is in Bengal and BJP is very much manipulative when it comes to identity politics. So BJP has forced Trinamool Congress to take part in identity and uh, ensure the vote bank. And therefore they are creating this. But, uh, but apart from this, uh, ten, years, uh, 10 years back, there was no such university or colleges dedicated to the Dalit, Dalits uh, specifically, so to say. Okay, thank you. Very nice presentation and very creative, very creative, very much creative. We are aware about your idea of West Bengal and all these things. Very nice. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank Means you, a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Professor Vimal Thorat, ma'am. Um, uh, Mohitesh, uh, uh, Hindi Hindi थोड़ी आती है ना आपको समझ में आती है हिंदी में पूरी पूरी आती है मैडम टूटी फूटी हिंदी मुझे भी मेरी भी ही टूटी फूटी हिंदी है द वेस्ट बंगाल में इतनी लंबी दलित हिस्ट्री है और मूवमेंट भी है पॉलिटिकल कल्चरल एंड लिटरेरी मूवमेंट साथ साथ चलती थी लेकिन क्या वजह है कि व्हाट इज द why why uh, the dalit uh, literary movement has now taken up at that uh, like in maharashtra gujarat or uh, uh, tamil nadu 
and in other part of uh, India, the whole whole of India, you can consider the whole of India. It's a, it's become a, a Dalit movement, uh, Indian Dalit movement. Uh, so, kya reason hai ki uh, Dalit uh, writers may wo Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar ya Dr. Peri uh, or ya Peri or ya Mahatma Phule ke vicharo ko accept karke unhe atmasat karke usse abhivakti dena uh, apne literature ke dwara apne rachnao ke dwara ye kyun nahi ho raha hai jabki Bengal, uh, West Bengal bahut hi rich apni culture mein mana jata hai और जैसे कि आपने बात की है नमो शुद्रा मूवमेंट और पौंडराज और तमाम जितने भी दलित कम्युनिटी है तो उनमें बहुत सारी इंटेलेक्चुअल्स है और लेखक भी है कुछ लोगों को मैं जानती हूं अनिल 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 मंडल नो नॉट अनिल विश्वास अनिल मंडल एक है जो जिन्होंने सबसे पहली कविता उन्होंने लिखी है जो कि मेरे एक किताब में शामिल है एक कलेक्शन में शामिल है बंगाल से तो बंगाल में बहुत कम लोग हमें मिले तो क्या वजह क्या है व्हाट इज द रीजन बिहाइंड इट व्हाई इट इज नॉट टेकन अप स्टिल या मैन ऑफ दैट्स अ वेरी गुड क्वेश्चन एंड वेरी रिलेवेंट आई थिंक सो आई वुड से दैट देयर आर दलित अंबेडकर राइट दलित राइटर्स फॉर इंस्टेंस बट मोस्टली फ्रॉम नमशुद्रोज uh for instance monohar mouli bishwas is one major writer yes, yes. mono monoranjan bapari mm. is another major writer yes and there is a, a woman writer uh, kollani thakur kollani thakur kollani thakur as you know so the face of dalit uh, literature in bengal is predominantly represented by these three uh, <laughs> namoshudro uh, writers and also recently uh, once again because of this anti because of the identity politics uh, that has emerged in bengal because of the intervention of bjp west bengal government has created a dalit sahitya academy it's a government academy dalit sahitya academy okay. and there monoranjan bapari i think okay. he is the he is the director of the of the chairman monoranjan bapari yeah okay. monoranjan bapari is the director of the chairman okay in uh, uh, but before that in 1992 this is a, this dalit sahitya academy is a recent phenomenon it was established last year but in 1992 uh, this girl from as i mentioned this tribal girl chuni kotal chuni kotal chuni kotal she committed suicide because she was tortured uh, psychologically by her professor ramin professor and after the death of uh, chuni kotal the namoshutros in particular and the dalit sin general of bengal they founded dalit sahitya sangstha dalit sahitya sangstha which was founded by monoranjan by monohar mouli bishwas and under that banner they have produced lots of literary works lots of literary works they have produced annually they have published books and magazines in bangla you have Uh, authors from pondro community as well for example there is an author called Sh- uh, shamal kumar param uh, shamal kumar pramanik shamal kumar pramanik is a pondro poet and this person uh, uh, you know this book has been written by uh, dilip gayen i mentioned dilip gayen it's in bangla and you will find dilip gayen has authored about 28 books in bangla most of the dilip gayen's books are political uh, pamphlets meant for the dalits who do not know english so he writes in the vernacular he teaches bangla in, in a school uh, monohar mouli bishwas writes in both english and bangla so and there is there are like the people who have whose works have been featured in these collections pondro monisha eight volumes of pondro monisha all these people have produced substantial literary works but i would say that at the end of the day somehow they their works have not been disseminated at the national level that is why 
That's I, I cannot say that the huge bulk of work that is produced in Maharashtra and Tamil Nadu, for example, is not same in Bengal. You are absolutely right that Bengal doesn't produce that great amount of uh, Dalit literary works. But at the same time, they do produce certain amount of work, but those do not come to the limelight because for some reason or the other, they are not translated, they are not disseminated, so people don't get to know about them. Even I discovered the literature I of... <laughs> yeah. I got the translation of uh, uh, the, the three... Monoranjan three... Bapari. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was recently translated. Yeah, yeah. and uh, this Monohar Ma Maulu Bisha surviving in the, in my world. Yeah, uh, but but the, the very very few very few. Uh, You're right. The, 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 in the, if you count, uh, you can count on your finger. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, they are, uh, very uh, less in their uh, in number. Yeah, and uh, the, uh, even though there is a. Now translation, they, some of them are writing in English, but their, their writing is not going uh, out out of the country. True, true. Because uh, I, I I am very much in touch with the uh, with the uh, with the students who are working on uh, the lit literature uh, outside in India. Uh, they they also mention why there is a because of the CPI, CPIM um, the regime for thirty three years they suppress the the, the deliberately suppress this movement the Dalit movement because they always uh, always uh, say that there is no caste system in uh, West Bengal yeah. the, uh, there is there is only caste class class, class, class system. Yeah. So that is one of the reason, maybe, and uh, I think uh, there are many, many, many intellectuals now. You you have mentioned the names. Uh, so why can't they come together and form a, a very, very, uh, very powerful movement? Because Dalit movement has become a very powerful movement uh, all over India, uh, and it's a very. Uh, uh, and the literature movement uh, already uh, everybody uh, working on that so many scholars are working on that written so many big books so this is my <laughs> my uh, eagerness and my uh, i feel very bad about it uh, west bengal se bahut aur number aani chahiye aur rachnaye aani chahiye kyunki आपने जीवन कथा का किया जिक्र किया है किसने लिखा था ये जीवन 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 कथा राजेंद्रनाथ सरकार राजेंद्रनाथ सरकार राजेंद्रनाथ सरकार की तो ये तो बहुत लंबी बहुत पुरानी मतलब उसकी लिटरेरी एक क्या कहना चाहिए एक लिटरेचर की एक बहुत पुरानी परंपरा रही है तब भी क्यों नहीं आ रहा है ये मेरा सवाल था आपने अच्छा सा जवाब दिया है बहुत आई एम सेटिस्फाइड विद योर थैंक यू थैंक यू एंड इट्स अ वेरी वेरी इंफॉर्मेटिव एंड वेरी इंटेलेक्चुअल प्रेजेंटेशन ऑफ योर्स आई एम रियली हैप्पी रियली रियली हैप्पी एंड आई गॉट सो मेनी पॉइंट्स न्यू पॉइंट्स अबाउट द नामशुद्रा एंड द पौंड्राज एंड एंड द अदर movement and their writing thank you very much thank, thank you so much thank you so much thank you ma'am uh, dr niketan jamulkar sir hello dr niketan jamulkar sir anna <laughs> unmute kara madam unmute ko hot nahi lokar lok ho ka to parantya dusra question ghew apan परमिट हेलो हेलो सर यस हेलो आवाज सर बोला दमोलकर सर आवाज हेलो हेलो हाँ बोला सर आवाज का मैडम हो हो ये तो है सर जय भी नमो बुद्धा है मैडम सर्वान जय भीम सर Uh, let me thank you to our honorable speaker who has spiritedly delivered his lecture and presentation madam in 
सर व्हिडिओ सुरू करता येईल का परमिशन दिला आहे सर एट सम पॉइंट ऑफ अवर डिस्कशन वी केम फ्रॉम वेअर मीडिया स्टार्टेड हॅलो व्हिडिओ नाही दिसला तरी तुमचा ऐकायला येतो ऐकायला येते का हो हो त्यावेळेस बोला होता की जो आहे अनटकेबिलिटी व चांदाल से चालू ही करके सो देर इज सम इन्फॉर्मेशन आय लाईक टू शेअर विथ यू डॉक्टर आह साळून के किताब लिखे आहे वैदिकांची धर्मसूत्रे आणि बहुजनांची गुलामगिरी हॅलो येस सर सुन रहे आपली आवाज आ रही सर बोलिये तो उसमे शायद ऐसा पडणे मे आहे की द चाइल्ड बॉर्न ऑफ आउट ऑफ ब्राह्मीन गर गर अँड लोअर कास्ट दे आर लेबर्ड लाईक चंडाल and on the other way other way they are called as nishat uh, that's the information i wanted to share with you thank you and the other thing is also i would like to uh, we were also discussing about raja ram mohan rai so before that our history is very cruel for the person who has created uh, made a history je जब शिवाजी महाराज की पिताजी की डेथ हो गई उस समय जिजाऊ महाराज कभी सती नहीं गए पर दैट थिंग हैज नेवर मेंशन इन दैट पर्टिकुलर फैशन इन आर हिस्ट्री और उसके बाद में अहिल्या भाई होड़कर जो है उनके भी पति जब है उनका भी देहांत हो गया तो मल्लार राव होड़कर जो थे उन्होंने भी उनको प्रिवेंट किया एंड देन शी बिकम अ वेरी सक्सेसफुल एंड रिस्पेक्टेड रूलर Thank you. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak. Thank you, Sir Damudkar, Sir. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, with the permission of uh, honorable guest, uh, I take a uh, 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 last question. And uh, this question from Akshay Gunakirti, a student from Tata Institution. Uh, as you said, around 23% population is uh, scheduled caste. Uh, then uh, what issues sc mla res to get elected in the assembly election <clears throat> okay the point is that uh, that's a good question akshay uh, uh, i would say that uh, the the there is among the political parties as i said you you can be an sc mla right you you can you can be an sc mla you can be an sc candidate in politics but if you are uh if you are you know uh, supporting let's see if you are a tmc candidate if you are a bjp candidate if you are a cpm candidate you are ultimately supporting the brahminical political parties for example in bengal what is happening is that in bengal scheduled castes mostly live like in the ghettos okay so in kolkata there is a very rare presence of the scheduled castes to go away from kolkata let's say towards south side south 24 parganas towards north north 24 parganas you would find brahmin population is decreasing scheduled caste pop- population is increasing at the end of the day those seats from where scheduled castes win they either win with the tickets from uh, tmc or cpim or bjp so they are not ideologically informed it is not enough to, it is not enough for one to be a scheduled caste one has to be ambedkarite one has to support a bahujan political cause only that way you can when you are in power you can you can fight and contribute to your community but these uh, most of these mlas sc mlas they are you know by name they are sc mlas or they are fighting from the scheduled caste constituencies but they do not support in any way or they are not even conscious of the ambedkarite political or even bahujan causes they never 
run with a ticket, let's say, of BSP. They don't fight with a ticket uh, from Bohujan Samajwadi Party. Most of the SC MLAs who eventually go to the assembly, they have they serve the interest of Trinamool Congress or Bharatiya Janata Party or Communist Party. So they do not support the interests of the Bohujan masses. That's why the, even after they are elected, the, the issues they raised to get elected are the issues raised by TMC or BJP or CPIM. It has nothing to do with the Dalits. That's why even if you are elected, you can't do anything. That, that would be my response. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So it's like I, I came across this social media post a, a few days back, which said that uh, if a, if a Brahmin uh, can embrace BSP, then that way she or he can undergo de-Brahminization. But if a Dalit embraces BJP, then the Dalit loses Ambedkarite politics. We'll never be able to contribute to the Dalit community's uh, advancement. I think that social media post resolves the problem. And most of the Dalits here, none of them are for BSP, Bohujan Samajwadi Party. All of them are either voting for Congress or for Communist Party or for uh, uh, BJP. That I think the more important question to ask is not uh, about SCMLAs. I think the more important question to ask is why did BSP not survive in Bengal? And as, uh, as uh, Professor Thorat rightly mentioned uh, at one point, why did Scheduled Caste Federation decline in Bengal? I think these are the more important questions to ask. An answer is at one level because the Scheduled Caste were, were not politically sensitized enough. They were scattered like the Pondru population scattered. They're not united. They're not educated, agitated, agitated and, and, and organized the way Baba Shaya Ambedkar would have wanted them to be. Except for the Namoshudros, none of the Pondru, none, none of the Dalit communities are uh, politically uh, anti-caste wise sensitive. That's why Dalit politics has been un unsuccessful in Bengal. And in my uh, understanding, it will remain unsuccessful for a long period of time. Until as, as Madam said, until the, the Dalit communities come together and create a strong platform against the Brahmins of Bengal. But thank you for the question. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Okay. Against the Brahmanism, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what you need, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean Brahminism. Of course, I mean Brahminism, yeah. yeah. No. Thank you, they sir. Are not, they are not against Brahmin as a person. They are yeah. against yeah. ideology, of, ideology Brahmin. of Brahminism. True, true, true. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your intellectual presentation. Uh, Shubhangi, please go ahead. Yes, it's one one clarification and then uh, we we see can thanks okay. the, what Thank is the literal meaning, so much, of, the, the literal uh, meaning, meaning of the namo uh, what is the uh, namo shudra namo shudra yeah uh, i think it means like new shudras new shudra something like that so we are like we are we are the new shudra something like that i think it means like that because you know chandalas were converted into into a certain extent into untouchables, uh -huh. but they 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 use the word shudra, they didn't use the word touchable. But anyway, I understand that's a new new shudra. Yeah, like you are the new shudra, something like that, I would yeah. say. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I understand that. Please go ahead. Yeah, please, Shubhangi. Hello, Shubhangi. Hello. Dr. Alka Patil, ma'am. Open my cam camera. Yes, yes. Should I have to open camera or not? Thank you. Camera open, Karu Shakta. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I am. Thank you, uh, Chot Pagar, madam. Thank you. Jai Bhim everyone. I am Alka Patil, Assistant Professor, SS Girls College, Gondia. Am I audible? Yes, sir. yes audible, ma'am. Please. Thank you. I am going to present what of thanks for today's webinar. First of all, I would like to thank today's webinar chairman, Honorable Dr. Sudhjyothora, sir, 
former chairman of UGC and ICSSF, New Delhi, and president of Association for Social and Economic Equality, Nagpur. Thank you so much, sir, your valuable guidance and informations every Sunday and every webinar. You enlightened us for different topics. Today also topic is very important to us, channel to Nagashudra, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Next, I would like to thank today's webinar chief guest, Honorable Dr. Mohitish Mandal, sir, head of department of uh, English, uh, English Presidency College, uh, uh, Kolkata. Thank you so much, sir, for your valuable speech and very deepest knowledge. I think it is not enough a single session to discuss or to listen. It is not enough a single session to listen to you, sir, because it is very deepest knowledge about the Namoshudra and Chandal, how the Namoshudra and come from Chaturmana system and channel to Namoshudra, Nakshudra and new, new Shudras. Thank you so much, sir. You gave us very valuable guidance. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, next, I would like to uh, thank uh, Honorable our Vimal Thorat, Madam. Always Vimal Thorat, Madam, discusses uh, actual, actual situation in the particularly that areas. Today, we discussed about Kolkata region, what condition has have in a particularly women's and particularly women's and uh, and the, uh, that movements which Alka Patil, madam, you are muted. Madam, okay, okay. okay. Yes. Audible? Yes, audible now. I would like to thank Dr. Bimbal Thorat, madam. Hamesha, uh, discuss on the ground level topics. Thank you so much, madam. Your, your participation is very important to us. Thank you so much, madam. Uh, after that, I would like to thank today's coordinators, Dr. Trilog Hazari, sir. Dr. Gautam Kambre, sir. Vidya Chorpagar, madam. Thank you so much. And uh, Shubangi Khandare, Mara, Khandare for your effective anchoring. Thank you, Shubangi. And we. Madam, you are again muted. Madam, to me, mute Zalat. Mute art, Madam, to me. I unmute myself. I unmute myself. Am I audible? Okay. Yes, audible. Okay. Audible, ma'am. Okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, and thank you all the participants who made us our webinar very effectively successful. Uh, in the participant, I would like to thank uh, Tangara sir. Uh, I think uh, in the uh, question associations, uh, today is not Tangara sir. But uh, Sujoy uh, Kranti Goshal sir. Sudodhan Devata, sir, Gunakirti, sir, and Trilok Sajara, sir, I would like to thank. We are a very effective interaction for our sessions. And I would like to thank Amrita. Okay, thank you so much, all of us. <laughs> On thank you, Amriti, Sangeeta Bure, Sangeeta Mishra, Bharti Gavai, Shuddhodan Dittar Sir, Vaishali Sardare, and Vinod Balbude, Vishaka Madam, Sona Suna, Raju Dere, Mr. SMR, Taram Bhagat Sir, Vishaka Pati, uh, Prem, uh, Prem Raj K, Prince Gajbiye, Sachin Chapte, and T.S. More, and rest of all the participants who gave us very valuable time and uh, made, made our seminar successful. Thank you. Thank you so much, all of you. And over to you, uh, Vidya over to you. Okay, thank, thank you, you Shubangi. Thank you. Thank you, Alka Patil, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, sir. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you Dr. Thank you, Thank you. and everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Nice Thank to you. meet you. Jai and good, good evening. <laughs> Jai